We dined at the captain's table. He made his toast and then asked Munchra Fog outright whether he was an opium trader and I as factotum. I looked at my master who merely said he was not. Captain Ong guffawed and commanded our glasses filled once more. It is a profitable business, he advised. A man can make his fortune in opium. If, and he addressed to the last of my master, he is not squeamish. My master is hardly squeamish, I interjected with a glance towards Monsieur Fogg. He is a gentleman and has no need of putting his hand to trade. I feared the captain would be offended, but instead he merely shrugged. If your master has never known need, then his honor is untested. Monsieur Fogg gave me a quelling look before turning to the captain. Your business is your own, Captain Ong, as long as you conduct me to Hong Kong in ten days as agreed. Fear not, Mr. Fogg, I have anxious customers awaiting my cargo after all. Well, at least my relationship went up with him. Groom him. Fascinating. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad Pastor Padu's priorities are in line here. Right now I'm just trying to keep my master's health in line as we get to Hong Kong, since apparently we have to go to Hong Kong. Instead of Chittagong, which I wanted to go to, despite the fight. The Laskers who made up the crew seemed to find me an object of great curiosity. I found them a great annoyance as they would be not be put off from asking incomprehensible questions as I went about my daily business. A young Malay shyly asked me what Paris was like. It is beautiful, I said cautiously. The Syene glitters like a snake. The theaters spill light and color onto the streets. The cafes are full of men and women debating and drinking endless cups of coffee. Beautiful women and beggars all on the same street. She looked at me curiously. I took a deep breath, dissatisfied with my answer. Never mind my thoughts. Perhaps you will see it yourself one day. She nodded, accepting my answer. I doubted she would ever set foot in the city of my birth. Never know. Well, here we come towards Singapore. So I could actually stop at Singapore right now. But I could get to Yokohama, like, right away. I think this is all going to be very shaky. I could, s we could slip us ashore or exchange some laborers for a dozen or so merchants. No, I think we have more going for us in Hong Kong. So, we exchanged some laborers for a dozen or so merchants and made sail by early afternoon. As expected. Greetings, Captain. Alright, going from Hong Kong to Yokohama. And seeing if we can find a way ahead. No. I do not box. For days, do not box, monsieur, as a rule. No, you cannot use my face. Not giving me any information I need.
with I'll cut Captain a new deal. All right, let's ask more about Hong Kong. And then let's figure out, maybe get into Manila? About Honolulu. I got like no real information from the dude. Like, he gave me information, like, all these different, like, buying options. Uh, don't get me wrong. Even though I was going through those options fast, it was only because, because I was being self-aware of the time. But I, I was being aware of that, and I can check the map to see, like, if there's a benefit of where I can sell stuff, etc., etc. So, I'm not rushing through it. Don't worry. The captain was on deck in the afternoon as I took a turn. He seemed to hesitate for a moment before he approached and abruptly said... My brother is an opium addict. Your brother? He looked around to make sure we were not overheard before nodding. My family is from Shanghai. We were poor, but instead of relieving my parents' cares, my older brother became an opium eater who lied and stole and wasted his days. Does that matter? I know that it is British opium. I am no fool, but he chose it. You are right. I agreed. Discomfited. He let your family down. I left Shanghai at 15. I ended up in Singapore with nothing to my name but a shirt and look at where I am now. My parents will live well on the money I send them. What of your brother? A look of fleeting sadness crossed his face before it hardened over. I do not know. Dead probably, if not begging on the streets. He took a shaky breath. I have not talked of this for many years, but I wanted to tell you this, Monsieur. Things are not so simple as you seem to think. Yeah, no kidding. He seems to be discontent about the fact that his brother was an opium addict, yet he's, like, delivering opium, like, smuggling opium. We hit a squall today, and we're confined to our cabins. I could hear the sailors shout to each other outside as the ship pitched from side to side. Once your fog in an uncharacteristic display of humanity was noisily sick into a nearby bucket. I mopped his brow, an act which he clearly deemed overfamiliar, even in his compromised position. Well, too bad. I did it. Deal with it, Monsieur Fog. So at this rate, we're going to make it to Hong Kong, but we're not in America by the 50s yet, which makes me worried. I'm really hoping we can, I'm really hoping we can edge this out, but I don't know if we're going to make it around the world in 80 days. Did not expect a long trip like this. Hello. I don't think the crew would wor worry about the laborers, I'm assuming. He moaned, looking feverish, clammy, and rather warm to the touch. I pulled him into my cabin and gave him a drink of water. Shagria, he mouthed, clearly thanking me. He told me his name was Kabir, and he was bound for a job in a Hong Kong warehouse. Please do not tell anyone I am sick, he begged. Ah, they'd probably f find that his worthwhileness is not there and probably do something. Wait, his name is Kabir, but he's saying Shukriya. Oh, oh, that's his way of saying things, all right. But why? I asked. I have a job in an Apcar company warehouse. I do not want them to think I am sick. Weak, he coughed. Please, Sahib. All right. I let him stay in my room till he had recovered. I'm a good dude. I'm a good dude.
So right now it's looking like if, I, if I'm going to cut corners and try and get across the world fast enough, I'm going to have to go from Hong Kong. Are you serious? Somebody got here at day 14? Lucky bastards. I don't know the tricks of the trade in this game, nor do I care to know for a good long while until I play two or three times or learn it myself. But my plan is to get to Hong Kong, get to Yokohama, and hopefully I'll be able to go across maybe to Honolulu and then connecting to San Francisco or San Pedro. If I can do that, I'd be okay, I think. I think. The confidence that I feel or that I felt has dissipated. Significantly dissipated. Alright, what do you know about Hong Kong? Yeah, so let's avoid those dens then. Thank you. I just wish we did better. And there's a traveling circus in Yokohama. Fascinating. Ugh. I'm, st I'm still mildly frustrated. Well, really frustrated. I missed out on two big opportunities to make a lot of money. I thought Cheetah Gong was a go. I didn't realize I was screwing myself. Ugh. The sick Indian laborer was convulsing on deck in a thin blanket with fit when I came up. He looked over as I walked past. Careful not to make eye contact. He nodded, understanding that I was keeping his secret. Yeah, I just had like this instinct in my head, like, if I started conversing with him, other people, other workers would be like, something's up. So I did him a favor there, for sure. We reached our destination in the promised 10 days, quite a miracle. And one that Captain Ong was clearly proud of. He shook our hands with great gusto as we disembarked, his eyes dancing. Good luck, he called as I looked around the crowded, colorful lit harbor of Hong Kong. We made it. Let's do a little bit of exploring. And immediately we get our first interaction in Hong Kong. I was looking over a vault of bright red Chinese silk when a man accosted me. This man had a mustache so fine, so luxuriant, so well tended that I briefly lost the power of speech. I watched, mesmerized as it quivered with his every word of introduction. It seemed his name was Fix. He offered me a drink, and given that I had a few hours to spare, I could not in good conscience refuse. Aw, oh, shit. He led me into a dingy basement where a sour faced Chinese woman pre resided over several tables and a few couches with men and women, mostly Europeans, in various states of lulling intoxication. You, you frequent such a place? I asked, attempting to reconfigure my image of Muncho Fix. The gin is good, he told me, and ordered us a bottle to prove his claim. It was thin and sharp, but not wholly distasteful. We chatted amiably for a time, though I noted he kept my glass full and not his own. Listen, he said abruptly. I'm a police detective sent from the London office. London office, huh? Oh, shit! He presented me with his commission, which seemed in all respects genuine and correct. You have been duped, he resumed. Mr. Fogg's wager is a pretext. Last September, a robbery of 55,000 pounds was committed at the Bank of England by a person whose description answers exactly to that of Mr. Phileas Fogg. Yes, what? 50,000 pounds, did you say? 
I slurred, feeling the effects of the bottle of gin. It surely cannot be. You know scarcely anything of your master, Fix ground on. You went into his service the day he departed on this so-called wager carrying but a large quantity of banknotes. He is too gallant to, uh, to be a thief, I protested. Fix strokes his mustache. Thieves are frequently gallant, he assured me. Charismatic, even. Shit, suddenly a conspiracy. <laughs> you cannot accuse him of charisma. That's true, he doesn't have that much charisma. I have not met him. I only know that Scotland Yard have been sent me out here to capture this fog. The detective hissed a breath which fluttered the tips of his oiled mustache. They could arrest you as his accomplice. I have done nothing wrong, I protested. Then you must help me, he replied. Fix pressed a pipe into my hand and I unthinkingly lifted it to my mouth. As my head began to swirl and spin, my fingers shook. Yep. I just breathed in opium. Last thing I remember is the blurred and wavering outline of Fix's self-satisfied face as I fell upon the table. What well, if he wants help? Why did he just do that to me? Wait, where's all my money? The hell? Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, I have zero money, none of my possessions. None of my possessions, right? I can't shop or anything, of course. And when sure fog is nowhere to be seen. I need to stay where I am. I wandered the streets, desolate and alone. I had grown so used to tending to the whims of my master that I felt myself a stray leaf. Abandoned to the winds of terrible misfortune without him. Everywhere I went, I asked about him, but with scant success. I slumped outside our hotel, disconsolate, when a tramp approached me. You look as spit-polished as that other fellow, he remarked. Was going off to yoking hammy or something like that, the man replied, demonstrating a staggering lack of knowledge for the local man. With that, he, the fellow ambled away. In my adult state, it was as though he had never been. Yoking Hamming. Yokohama? Was that the truth of it? Well, it seems we have no other choice. Let's go. I awoke in a small, dark cabin with the familiar hum of an airship motor underneath me. As for my head, it was attached to my body, and that was the best that could be said of the situation. Where was I? How had I ended up, up aboard the ship? Wait, I just stayed at that hotel and had that interaction, unless that was all in my head. Paris World Fair, roaring success. A fragmented series of images sprang into my mind with vivid force. An opium den fixes ac accusation against my master. An opium pipe pressed into my gin-soaked hands and in only blankness, I resolved to find an answer to the most important question. 
Where was my master? Just as soon as I could bring myself to up tightness, that was. Ambulation was a task best approached in stages, and I am ashamed to say that I fell at the first hurdle and collapsed back into my hard cot, trembling and insensate. 